The products and claims made about specific products on or through this site have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration and are not approved to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. This site is not intended to provide diagnosis, treatment, or medical advice. Products, services, information, and other content provided on this site, including information that may be provided on this site directly or by linking to a third-party website, are provided for informational purposes only. Please consult with a physician or other healthcare professional regarding any medical or health-related diagnosis or treatment options. Information provided on this site and linked websites, including information relating to medical and health conditions, treatments and products may be provided in summary form. Information on this site, including any product label or packaging should not be considered as a substitute for advice from a healthcare professional. This site does not recommend self-management or health of health issues. Information on this site is not comprehensive. It does not cover all diseases, ailments, physical conditions, or their treatment. Contact your healthcare professional promptly should you have any health-related questions. Never disregard and delay medical advice based upon information you have read on this site. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Awakening Health Channel. Today, I am very excited to share with you someone I believe to be one of the world's experts about water. His name is Stephen Settlemeyer, and he has an exciting story to share with us about water, and it's also a love story. So he's got some amazing credentials. I'm going to let him speak to you about his early beginnings in math and physics and science of all kinds, and, and how he ended up exploring the world of water and how we are all benefiting now from his amazing explorations. So Stephen, thank you so much for joining us on the New Awakening Health Show. Well, thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it. And um, I'll get into a little bit of my background so people understand where I'm coming from. Great. I was, I started in theoretical mathematics and spaceflight mechanics when I was 15 and 16 years old. And I worked for a company, Martin Marietta, while I was going to high school. And I also was the youngest to receive a National Foundation grant uh, that started Arctic and Alpine research, or what we know as, as climate change today. And from there, I went to Colorado School of Mines still working at Martin Marietta, became a manager there. I was one of the youngest managers they ever had. And then I left that um, during the, the era that uh, we were doing a lot of layoffs because th there was an administration change between the Re Republicans and Democrats. So I went into doing scoreboards for a company called Conrack Corporation. Conrack was a corporation that did the display information at airports and also all the, the displays at the stadiums and arenas. I ended up taking over the company uh, that locally from them and ended up doing McNichol Sports Arena and then going up to the 1976 Olympics to do the Olympics up there. From there, I went to inventing the flat screen TV uh, because of my interest in the fiber optics. And I was one of the forerunners that said the TV was gonna hang on your wall, just like the picture in back of you would be about that size. <laughs> and uh, that was back when the TV sets weighed about 850 pounds. Wow. And I said they were gonna weigh about 35 to 50 pounds, be you know, four feet and hang on your wall. And nobody believed me at the time, but uh, I was the first one ever to do a high definition TV in the United States. And from there, because of the lack of support that we received here, I then sold the patents off to foreign interests because I went to RCA and Zenith and appeared in front of Congress and, and tried to get Apple and Intel and everybody else excited about it. No one wanted to save the TV industry here. So to feed my family, I had to sell the patents off. And from there, 
I kind of retired and I lived in Phoenix for a while and my wife was drinking bottled water out of plastic and paying three, four, five dollars a bottle for it when we'd go out to a restaurant. And that bothered me quite a bit because I knew it was just tap water. Most bottled water is really tap water. And so I decided being a, a inventor that I could come up with something better and I invented a process to purify the water and I did not understand that what I was doing would change the water to the extent that it did, but it changed it. So there was a long period of scientific research to find out exactly what the water was that I had invented or changed. So Stephen, we have some very um, aware, nutritionally and health-minded and even physiological people who love to watch this show. And they know that I am an advocate for supporting our bodies with what nature provided for us originally. I was hoping that you might be able to speak a little bit to us about your water and what's happened to the water on the earth, the type of water that we're drinking. And I had quite a discussion the other day with someone who was collecting his rainwater and thinking that his rainwater was pure. So I was hoping that you might be able to speak to these kinds of issues and talk to us about why it is that really pure water makes a difference and how your water is a different kind of pure than what we call pure water. Okay, I, I'd love to. In fact, I find it with my background in physics and math, um, I, I was curious about why this water was so different from other waters. Um, we, <coughs> we tried to store it in plastic and we found out that this water just was actually destroying the plastic, would cause it to dissolve, which caused us some consternation. And uh, even though my what my wife was drinking it. So we decided, I decided that I was gonna do intense research on water. Now back 10, 12 years ago, I was like everyone else. Water is water. Main water is probably better than other water. You know, so I, I was probably like most everyone else. So when I started to sincerely study water, one of the first people I went to was Dr. Rustin Roy, and he was head of material sciences at Penn State University. And Dr. Russell Roy was one of the founders of material science in the United States. So I went to him and lo and behold, Dr. Russell Roy was also trying to study water. <clears throat> and it turned out that a lot of the major scientists in the world had turned their interest to water because water is so hard to understand. We just think of it as H2O, but it's far more complex than that. When they try to model water at our national labs here, Sandia Labs, which can model nuclear fusion, they found out they can make a model of one molecule of water, but when they make two models of molecules of water, the computer can't compute it. It's beyond the computation and they can't understand the interaction. They can do one molecule, but two molecules destroys their computations. So we, we understood it was a very complex model. So Dr. Russell Roy was going to find out what the difference in water was between all the types of water. And we, we were interested just in pure water, H2O, just the simple two hydrogens and an oxygen because that's water. We found out it's, it's water is, comes in much more different forms than that. For instance, there's the H2O, but hydrogen can actually have different forms and oxygen can have different forms. One of the ways to illustrate this is if I can throw this model up. Sure. You can see a model that I'm talking about right here. So are we talking about heavy water? 
Yeah, can you see the hydrogen versus deuterium on the screen there? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, so here's a hydrogen, and it, as you can see, it has one proton and one electron. That's a basic hydrogen. Now, what we call deuterium, it has a proton also, or a center, but it also has an extra neutron. So it has two particles in the middle. A neutron has no charge to it. A proton does have a charge. Then of course you have the electron. But this is what we call heavy water. And heavy water was used in the war efforts, is that correct? Yes, it is. In fact, that's that was the big effort that the Germans were doing in the United States and even the Japanese were trying to make heavy water. And that's why we bombed a lot of their factories over there that was making heavy water. The big raid that you, there was a TV show about it, how we destroyed their heavy water factory. And that was a very true story about us stopping them. And what it is though, it's just more than that because then you can say, well, you have one heavy oxygen or heavy hydrogen, a normal hydrogen, and what in oxygen, right? Except that isn't the case. It's a water, little bit more complex, eh? Yeah, <laughs> water comes in nine different forms. The, the most prevalent form, of course, is what we know as H2O. But if we call deuterium D, then you can have a hydrogen and a deuterium in oxygen, or you can have two deuteriums in an oxygen. But oxygen can also get heavy too. Oxygen, oxygen can have extra neutrons in it also. So there's a form of oxygen called O16, O17, and O18, and they get heavier. So now all of a sudden you have H2, O16, O17, and O18. Then you have HD, O16, O17, and 18. Then you have D2, two deuteriums, O16, O17, and O18. So all of a sudden, there's nine forms of water on the face of this earth. And there's probably more that we don't know about. But these are the ones that we've been able to perceive so far. And Stephen, are we discovering more and more, or at least it's what I've understood, that when we deplete the deuterium, we have a water that is far more flexible, far more absorbable, far more capable of supporting the detoxification processes and the circulatory processes of the body? Is that true? That's true. What happens is that deuterium is heavy. It has this extra neutron. And neutron does nothing but go around and hit into other atoms and into electrons. And if it knocks an electron off, then you have a free radical. Oops, we don't want those, do we? We don't want those. <laughs> so, <laughs> they create all kinds of inflammatory damage. <laughs> yeah. Well, in fact, if you drink too much heavy water, too, too much that has the heavy water in it, it kills you. It destroys your organs. So... They have now found out that it's the reverse also. If you drink water that has been depleted of this deuterium, yes. that's lighter than, than the heavy water mm -hmm. by 30 parts. One of the studies that have been done that shows, and it was done on um, clinical trials and also on rats and labs, it showed it cured 90% of depression. No matter what the depressions were, 90% of the people were cured of depression. So we're talking about deuterium depleted water cured depression. Yes. And what degree of deuter deuterium depletion? It was about 30 parts. The normal amount of deuterium in the world, in, in the oceans, is about 156 parts per million. I see. So, and that's interesting. That is not why people started looking at heavy water. They used it for the nuclear industry. They also used it in the geophysic 
industry because when carbon dating started failing after they get past a certain age, then they started looking at water or the amount of deuterium that objects collected to see how much deuterium had gathered into the calcified material. And they found out how much was in that and that way they could age it. And so they started looking at it for geophysical reasons. And because they started doing that, then they started wondering, well, what did it do to the animals back then? And one of the theories that's floating around is why were dinosaurs so big? <laughs> you know, and we're so small. <laughs> right. What changed that the dinosaurs were very big animals? They walked on land. Yes. Like we did. They were mammals. Mm -hmm. Why were they so large? Was it an abundance of food? Well, we have an abundance of food. We've always had abundance of food. Um, what what was the difference? Was it were we closer to the sun, farther away from the sun? Probably not. We've probably been in this orbit pretty close. The only thing that probably might have changed over that time period is water. And so maybe the water had some significance. So they started looking at what does deuterium do to humans? And there's the international conference that meets about every three years. And they started finding out some unbelievable facts about it. One of the facts they found out that if you go down to about 120 parts per million of deuterium, that it started having some wonderful effects on cancer. It was killing the cancer in the bodies. So there's studies about trying to study deuterium and effects upon cancer and other diseases. Now, have you seen any of these types of effects with people who have been drinking your water? Yes, we have. We, we've had a lot of people, and we don't know if it's because of the deuterium depletion or some of the other properties that we have in our water. And our water has some other properties to it. It, it has called easy water or exclusion zone water, which is called the fourth phase of water that was studied by Dr. Gerald Pollack up at the University of Washington. It also has a different hydrogen bond. We, we've rearranged the bond in there through a patented process, and that could be attributing to it, or all of these aspects could be attributing to it. And don't you have 102% oxygen in the water as well? Yes. And the water is very pure. Now, one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that we were studying water. <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to your original question about, okay. about rainwater. Yes. The World Health Organization has come out and said there is no clean water anywhere on the face of the earth, anywhere. Yes. That, and what I mean by clean water, it, it has other chemicals in it or it has other minerals in it. Some of those are probably good minerals. A lot of them are not good chemicals. Uh, they found out that almost 6% of the population of the United States has a high level of polytetrafluoroethylene in it, or the stuff off of nonstick bands. Boy, that doesn't sound very yummy. No, it isn't. <laughs> and you can't get it out of your system. 175 million Americans that drink tap water or other, other type of waters also are exposed to radiation. So we're drinking radioactive water. And where does that come from? That comes from a lot of sources, from all the nuclear testing that we did. And this is the life cycle. We have water on the face of the earth. And let's talk about, let's get into a really interesting um, okay. part of water. <laughs> Where did water come from? That is one of the big questions that scientists can't answer right now. And they're really trying to look at it through the universe because we're, we want to leave this earth and we want to go to other planets. And for us to survive, we have to have water. Yes. In fact, you can only live two days without water before all your organs start shutting down. You can live over a month without eating any food. So, so we need water. Are we going to carry water with us? That's a little too heavy. We'd like to find water on other planets, 
but is that water that we can drink or not on other planets? That's a big question. Yes. Well, the question is, how, how does this form? Well, there's been some theories about we got hit by comets, and the comets brought water, and when they entered the atmosphere, they would melt. Except 75% of the face of the Earth is water. So that means we would have to have some really big comets that would have to keep hitting us. And if they did, they probably would have knocked us out of orbit. So that theory doesn't really hold water, so to speak. <laughs> so how, how does water form? One of the theories that I am particularly interested in, I believe, is that the earth makes its own water, just like it makes its own oil. And what happens is we have a nuclear interior, a center in our planet. And one of the byproducts of this nuclear reactor that we have down at the middle of our planet happens to be hydrogen. It, the sun is mostly hydrogen. Mm -hmm. That's why it, you know, we know hydrogen is very integral to nuclear reactions. And so it creates hydrogen. Well, that's one of the components of water. The other component of water, of course, is oxygen. Well, where does oxygen come from? But the other thing this little nuclear reactor does is it breaks down all the heavy, heavy elements, uranium, plutonium, that sort of stuff. They decay in the lead and everything else. One of the decay products is oxygen. But now we have hydrogen and we have oxygen. Of course, they're like gases, so they seep up through all the molten rock and through the, the rock that's cooling. And all of a sudden they, they meet each other and they start forming water. And we now have something we call primary water or primal water that's way down towards the center of the earth. And it is so pure water that it's not dissolved any of the rocks because it's still hot and it won't take anything onto it that it is a gaseous water, just like steam and vapor, without any, any minerals in it whatsoever. So that's now perforating up through all the split rock and everything, just like uh, our oil companies do when they do their fracking. It breaks the rock so it can seep up. It's that we have large pools of water underneath the mantle now. And of course, with the earth rotating, that forces the water to come to the surface. So that's how one of the theories is that we got all this water on the earth. And they did mass, mass calculations and how big the earth is, and it fits in it with the perfect. The earth could be making its own water. Just like they now believe that maybe the earth is making its own oil too. And that's why I went to Colorado School of Mines, and when I went to mines, studied oil drilling, we thought we could only go down 800 feet, 900 feet to hit oil. And then all of a sudden they're going down 1,000 feet. They're going down 2,000 feet. Now I believe they're going down five miles and they're finding oils. They're going way down beyond where dinosaurs even lived and they're finding oil in the rocks. So how, how did oil get down in there? Well, you have as I told you, all the breakdown, the hydrocarbons, basically oil is hydrocarbons. So as they seep up through the rocks, the bacteria, because it's a nice warm environment, environment they start forming hydrocarbons. So we're forming oil and we're forming water on the face of the earth, or not on the face, but down below. And because they're lighter materials than the rocks and we're spinning, they tend to come up to the, towards the surface. So, so now we have water down there. So the water seeps up and it becomes the oceans and lakes and rivers and, and that sort of stuff. But as the planet starts cooling and these hot waters and, and the sun's beating down on it, water now evaporates and it moves up towards our atmosphere and it forms an atmosphere around the planet. So now life can be supported on this planet. 
but as the natural earth does now, it picks up everything else in that rain. When the volcano goes off, then it spews up into there. It becomes part of it when the water coalesces, it picks up those particles and rains down on us. But man comes along and now we're popping nuclear bombs up in the atmosphere and we're doing chemicals up in the atmosphere. So our natural cycle now is that anything that we make and we throw up in the atmosphere or evaporates off the face of the earth goes up into our atmosphere, becomes part of the atmosphere of the earth and rains back down on us. Well, that rain hits all the product that's on the, that we grow all the grinning, all the corn, uh, all the plants, all the animals goes into the ocean. So whatever pollution we put into that atmosphere now becomes part of the cycle. Of course, the water that's on top of the earth is heavier, and so it tries to sink down into our aquifers. So it sinks down to the aquifers. Now the aquifers are polluted. And of course, all the dumping we did in the aquifers of all the chemicals and all the pollutants. So the whole thing now has become polluted. So when you talk about spring water, you're talking about water that's being forced up out of the face of the earth. But unfortunately, it also has seeped down all these chemicals that we've done and it's polluting all the sources. We're talking about all the water now because it's a whole life cycle. The rainwater, of course, is replenishes everything. When it rains, goes in our lakes. The lakes then bleed into the aquifers. Our rivers bleed into the aquifers. Everything tries to go into the aquifers that it can, or it sits on a, a um, geometric formation of clay where it doesn't seep in, but we still drink that. So now, man has successfully polluted all the water on the face of the earth. For so many years, we just dumped everything into the rivers. Of course, those rivers evaporate, they go up in the atmosphere. We dump stuff into the lakes. Uh, for how many years was it okay to take drums of oil out to the ocean or radioactive material and just throw it overboard so it goes into the ocean? They break open, goes up to the top, evaporates. You know, we, uh, we had um, a 250 nuclear tests here in the United States uh, that we popped bombs off to see how they would react uh, out in Las Vegas. Um, all those yes. bombs, yeah, all those bombs went into the atmosphere. All the um, ones at the uh, Bikini Atoll that we blew all those bombs up. And of course, you have Russia doing it. You had China doing it. So everybody's contributed to, Great Britain did it. Uh, Canada did it. France did it. So you have all these countries that have successfully thrown radioactive material up into the atmosphere. Then we have the human body, and it's being polluted in multiple ways. How can your beautiful divinity world help us to deal with the predicament that we're in now because of all of the pollution that's happened to the atmosphere and the atmosphere of our human form? Yeah, and, and that's a very good analogy to it because of our skin is like the atmosphere and the earth is like our interior and whatever passes through our skin barrier whether we put it on our face because of cosmetics or we drink it or we take a shower in it we take showering chlorine all the time uh, you know when you go in and you live in a city you're getting chlorinated water which means that chlorine passes through your cells into the body and it's in your blood so what we did with Divinium, we filter it 16 times. We take out every drop of pollution that there is, anything that you can find. And the other thing, then we distill the water. So we go through reverse osmosis. We go through carbon filters and other type of filters. We then um, do a DI, deionize it. We run it through uh, distillers. Then we put it through the last process, which is my distiller, which also acts 
as a device to change the water. We actually change the hydrogen oxygen bond. So this water not only is pure, it has nothing in it. None of the endocrine disruptors that maybe hormones, nothing. And so we then bottle that in glass so it doesn't become contaminated. So Davinia water is a uncontaminated pure water, just like was on the face of the earth a very long time ago. Our mitochondria actually produce a very special water. Um, from what the way I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that our mitochondria actually produce exclusion zone water, the EZ water, and I understand Divinia water is EZ water. Is that true? And what benefit would there be in drinking EZ water? Clearly, we know, and you might want to explain this a little bit too, how on a mitochondrial level, we need our mitochondria to be healthy to produce that EZ water. And that EZ water in turn helps to keep our mitochondria and our energy stores strong. Yes. What, what's interesting about this is that when we refer to EZ water, that was the discovery of Dr. Gerald Pollack at the University of Washington. What he found out is that when water is near a hydrophilic surface or water loving surface, it rearranges the molecules in water. That is, it, it makes a, a, a rearrangement of the electrical arrangement of water, the, the way it's arranged. And when it does that, it creates a battery type of effect which means that it gives, there's some energy there to do chemical reactions, just like the battery in your car. That's why when you go two days without drinking water, all your energy is depleted and there's no energy to do it. So inside a cell is the mitochondria and a lot of other in the cells and, and other little small cells in it. Of course, the inside of a cell is hydrophilic too. And so is mitochondria. So inside the cell is this water that actually acts like a battery. It has energy to it. It actually will be able to transfer electrons and break the hydrogen to be able to do chemical reactions and donate oxygen too. And so the mitochondria actually uses that energy to do its chemical reactions. Without that, the mitochondria can't function and then the cell becomes inflamed or diseased. And we believe that's one of the reasons that cancer or other diseases are so prevalent is that you're actually dehydrated. And when we say dehydrated, we mean that you don't have enough water going through your cells or the right type of water. Now, all these contaminants that are in water, whether it's a pesticide or chlorine or anything, else, fluorine or fluoride or any other extra element in there can do what we call collapse the easy zone so it goes to zero, which means that there's no energy to do any, any chemical reactions. One of the things that Dr. Pollack found out is that how anesthesia works. When you inject anesthesia into a local area, it causes the easy zone to collapse to zero. So there's no energy there. Well, with no energy, there's no electron transport. With no electron transport, it doesn't mean that signals go through from the muscles to the nerves. And that's why there's no pain. There's nothing there to signal that there's pain because the electrons are blocked. Well, the same thing happens to the mitochondria in there. If there's pesticides or something that is blocked, the entrance of the water into the cell, then the mitochondria doesn't work. Or if it does, it tries to divide as it does um, to be able to reproduce other cells, but it doesn't have the right energy to split properly, so it mutates. And most of the mutations we call inflammation or cancer. And that's how we believe cancer starts, is from the mutation of the DNA because it doesn't have the right energy to split it properly. 
So it tries to split, but it can't do it properly. It doesn't have all the energy, so it does what it can. But that, what it does produce is cancerous. So water, we believe, and a lot of top physicists believe, and, and doctors now, and neurobiologists, and biologists, and everybody else, Nobel laureates, is that the genesis of almost all disease, we believe, is water. That if you don't have the proper water, if you don't have the water to do the chemical reaction, and if you don't have water to clean your body, because water is meant to cleanse the body, water doesn't feed you. It doesn't carry the nutrients into your cells, although you need it. Water is meant for cleansing. It's meant for doing the energy, to give the mitochondria energy, and it's for removing all the toxic material out of your body. So if you want to remove toxic material out of your body, the best thing you can do is use pure water. And that removes it. So that gets us back to Divinia. That's what Divinia is, is very pure water. It has easy water created in it. So your body doesn't have to use inner energy to create the Divinia or the easy water. So it's like extra energy that you have. It's free energy that you get in your body. It's a very pure water. And because it's a very pure water, then it carries away all the toxins. And because it's energetic water, we put extra energy into it by rearranging the molecules a little bit. By doing that, the hydrogen is available and the oxygen's available. It's deuterium depleted, so your body can use it better because your body doesn't like deuterium. So if you reduce that amount of deuterium, it's more bioavailable. So we've tried to make this water that is easy water, deuterium depleted, has extra oxygen in it. Your body likes oxygen. And it's a changed water that makes hydrogen and oxygen very available. So it's kind of a you know win-win situation for your body. So I'd love for you to, at this point, to share with us just a little bit about what you've seen with different health issues. And I can talk to you about ones I'm particularly interested in, whether you've seen them or not. But I was so touched when I saw the interview that you had with a gentleman who I believe was an engineer and exposed to plutonium, and how it appears that the deuteri that your water the Divinia water helped so immensely that he was able to go from a situation where his liver and his kidney were failing to actually becoming healthy and normal again. And I was wondering if that the latest um, uh, study of his bone marrow had come in. Yet. Yes, he, this gentleman was in a nuclear accident and and to put it in perspective, he entailed, inhaled plutonium and radium 15,000 times the level of what you and, and he inhaled it in 15 seconds, what you and I would get from standing outside in the sun for 50 years every day and night exposed to the sun. He got that in 15 seconds. Of course, we know what happens when you get too much radiation UV out in the out in the sun. You burn and you get cancer. He got 15,000 times that level that we would get in 50 years. He got that in 15 seconds. So he got in a massive dose of plutonium and uranium, and he inhaled it. One of the first things, of course, is he started throwing up. He was sick. Uh, they show signs of the flu, um, but he also could not hold any food down. It had burned his esophagus where he had inhaled it. And also, eventually, his liver and his kidneys couldn't clear it. He, his kidneys and liver were going into failure. Another thing is that your body trying to get rid of this stuff also will intake it into your bone marrow because it mimics iron, ferritin. And it just tries to get rid of it as fast as it can. This is destroying everything in your body. So 
So Ralph came to us after his wife saw an interview, another interview I did. And when he, he, he first tried the water and he thought, well, you know, what is water going to do? Not much. He tried it for a few months and then quit because he was skeptical of it. And then his liver and his kidneys really started going much worse. He started drinking, which did not help the situation. And about another six months went by and his wife decided, you're gonna get on this water and try it. So he got on the water and faithfully tried it. After about three months, he saw his liver and kidney go back to, to almost normal. After another three months, they were back at normal. So, and his esophagus showed no signs of burn whatsoever. It had repaired itself too. So he thought, well, this is really something, but I still have a lot of radiation that I've taken in my bones because his ferritin levels were about 10 times, I believe, normal. And he found a report that said it's not ferritin, it's really the radium and plutonium that he took, in, took into his bones. So he kept drinking it. And another period, about three months later, when he went back to look at the radiation level or even the ferritin levels in his bones, it was totally normal. So all the heavy materials that he had in his body, in his bones, had had been leached out, went to normal, and all his levels went back to normal for all the sodium, potassium, um, calcium, everything was normal. So he got a clean bill of health. So he was pretty happy about that. Um, one of the things that we've noticed that this water is very healthy for kidney and livers. It, it cleans out whatever has happened. We've helped people return to normal, people that were on the transplant list for either a kidney or a liver, drink the water and return perfectly back to health without any operation, without any drugs, without any intervention. They just return completely back to normal. So Stephen, are these people being monitored either by you or by their doctors? Are we looking at blood levels, doing charting? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, what we do is we tell them that if they want to, and I'm, I, I'm one that believes that you should be in charge of your own health. Me too. Uh, I think, you know, you know, and your body knows what it needs to do. You just need to give it the right materials to do it. One of the things that we urge people, all people to do, is go get a test from your doctor. Get a blood test. Look at your liver enzymes, the ALT and AST. Um, look at your kidneys, the creatinine levels, to see if it's okay. Look at all the levels in it, the normal blood test, so that you can tell where your sodium is, your calcium, your bilirubin, everything. Try to get a full panel on it. So are you talking about a CBC with diff and a metabolic panel? Yes, I am. Okay, okay so just a real basic. Real basic. Inexpensive panel. Yes. done by any medical doctor. Any medical doctor. In fact, you don't even need a medical doctor. You can go to a blood testing place now yes. and have it done. And so that's your baseline. You, it'll tell you, you know, what, what's happening to your body. Now, most people don't know how to interpret that. And it's pretty easy. If you just go online on the internet now, there's so, all sorts of information. But you, you also have to interpret the information about your monocytes or leukocytes or neophytes or any of those things to see what's happening to it. Let's talk about red and white blood cells. Yeah. About infections. And infections and and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So we say get a baseline of that and then start on Davinia water or any water, but you know, you've been on water, so you kind of know what's happening anyhow. But once you get these blood tests, these blood panels, try our water 
and after about two weeks to a month, go get another blood panel and see if anything has changed. And in fact, I will help you. What I do is I take that information and I put it into a chart. What I do is I give them a graph that actually shows the people the changes in their blood levels. And so they can see if they're improving. And uh, most people take that to heart that, that have some sort of problems and they will look at their blood levels to see what's happening. And we just had a gentleman that um, he was, he has five children, he's about 28 years old. Uh, his, he was going into kidney failure. Um, he had been an alcoholic, he'd quit drinking. But his bilirubin was uh, abnormally high which affects the brain, he can't think very well. And the doctor told him that he was, you know, headed towards having to have a replacement. So he, he did what I told him, he went to a doctor, got the charts, and that doctor, by the way, is now on our water too, and drinks it herself and recommends it. That's All the water she drinks now. Came back two weeks later and his building room had dropped by 50%. That's unheard of. Yeah, it, it, and so his kidneys started repairing themselves. And then another um, two weeks after that, he got another one, found out it dropped by 50% again. And I just was told that he woke up one morning and told his wife, you know what? I feel normal. I've been felt this way for five years. And he's only 28 years old. And so now he's going to be able to grow up with his family and his kids will have a dad, which is really wonderful. So, and these people, once you see what it's doing, once you have the physical proof, once you can put that in front of your eyes and look at it, of course, your body's going to respond even better to it. it your body's going to actually start repairing itself because you, your hopes are up again. Uh, you and I have talked about this before, about recall healing. Yes. Uh, which I think is very important. Um, you have to have hope. You have to have good thoughts, because I think your body reacts to bad thoughts, just like water does. And I, I think once you start seeing things happening, then it's a cumulative effect and it starts repairing itself even more. And so the water is the genesis of it, the start of it, when you see what's happening. And then your body realizes what's happening and it takes over and it repairs itself, which is absolutely wonderful. I mean, it's, we have hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of stories like that now about people that were on transplant lists, people who had hepatitis C, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Now, as we put up, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, I am not advocating that you do this by yourself. Of course, you go to a doctor. You work with your doctor on it. Um, but all you're doing is changing the water. I, I don't advocate changing anything else. Just change the water. Work with your doctor and look at what's happening in your body and see what's happening. So we're not advocating this replace doctors. We're not advocating this as your own health care. We advocate that you go see your doctor and get your health care from your doctor. But this is no harm, no foul. All you're doing is replacing your water with healthy water. And you can judge for yourself what happens. So Stephen, let's be a little bit more specific about replacing your water with healthy water or divinity. Um, are we talking about everything that you drink being replaced? Do you use this to make your tea with? Um, if people you know, mix protein drinks or things like that, should they be mixing it with divinity water? Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, one of the things that our water is, is not good water right now because it has a lot of contaminants in it. 
So if you're drinking water that has high arsenic in it or radioactive materials, and you're mixing that in your protein drink, you're still getting radioactive and arsenic in your, and the protein doesn't help that. It doesn't do anything. If you replace it with our water, use the pure water, then you're getting all the benefits of the protein, plus you're getting the benefits of the water flushing out the, the bad materials. <laughs> and then there's people like us, like we have a reverse osmosis system with four carbon filters, and we also have an ultraviolet light. And so that's the water we've been using for years. And so my question would be, would that water be okay to use for things like teas and you know other things, and just drink the Divinia water when we're going to be drinking our you know, half of our body weight in ounces. And do we actually need that much when we're drinking a water that actually supports the reduction of, that um, helps us actually hold on to our body weights? Yeah, one of the things that um, reverse osmosis does not do very well is that it, it depletes the water of oxygen. In fact, reverse osmosis is about 30% depleted oxygen. Mm -hmm. So it's low in oxygen, which I don't advocate drinking low oxygen water. Um, so it, it there's that problem with it. Reverse osmosis just also does not get out nanoparticles. You've probably read recently about all the nanoplastics yes. that are in the water. And reverse osmosis does not get that out. So you're still drinking plastic out of that. However, that being said, that's much better than just drinking the water out of the tap in the first place <laughs> or out of the well. So there's okay, degrees. Yeah, yeah, there's degrees of it. And that is a very good start on, on doing it. I personally would use distilled water over mm -hmm. our old water. Um, because it doesn't deplete the oxygen, plus it does everything that RO does. But uh, distilled water is also, the other thing about just RO water, let me go back for a second, is you really have to maintain that RO and all the filters. After about three months, the RO gets clogged up, and chlorine kills RO, by the way, too. If there's too much chlorine in the water, it kills the, the membranes and they just leak through. But you also have to make sure that all the pre-filters and the membranes are unclogged. If not, it starts growing bacteria on there. They're a very good source for growing bacteria. So if you're the type of person who has put an RO system in your house, you think it's gonna be good for three years, don't. You better have someone out and change those filters every three months to six months. If not, it goes the other way and starts growing bacteria and it becomes worse for you. You're better off drinking tap water than out of RO that's six months old because it actually has a lot of growth on it. And obviously you do maintain your RO, but the majority of people, they find out 90% of the people do not maintain their RO. They have someone install it and think, you know, it's going to be good for a long time. That's not the truth. So to the majority of people out there, I'd say, you know, spend a little dollars and maintain your RO every three months. Um, I, I also am a firm believer in distilled water. Unfortunately, most of the distilled water you get, you buy at the store and it comes in a plastic jug. Right. It has a whole bunch of plastic in it. And it dissolves it. Now, you've heard about BPA and how BPA is banned. What they haven't told you is that they replace BPA with BBP and BPC, is bad. <laughs> which is just as bad, but it's never been tested. So the FDA doesn't have jurisdiction over it. So they are kind of fooling you about that. So the plastic you're using, they say BPA is BPA free but it's not BBP or BBC free and almost all canned goods. If you look on them, if it doesn't say BBA free, then it has a BPA lining in there. So you're actually eating BPA through your food too now. Yes. 
So, and, and if it is free from it, then they could be using BBP or BBC in it too. So you have to be careful with that. So it's the old story about a guy goes to a doctor and says, doctor, every time I hit my head against the wall, it really hurts. And the doctor says, well, stop hitting your head against the wall. He goes, no, you don't understand. When I hit my head against the wall, it hurts. And the doctor says, just stop. Well, that's how we kind of view water. Stop drinking bad water. Just stop. You know, and then when you drink good water, if you had to buy your own distiller at home, the countertop, that's what I would advocate. Of course, they only last about a year before they get gummed up or even less than that. But that's the type of water. I, now, your system you described, I would take that and put it in a countertop distiller, and I would say that's good water. Now, it's not changed water. I understand. It's not easy water, but it's it's better water than 99% of the other waters you can get out there. So we're using the Divinia water to drink as our drinking water, but we're yeah. using the other water for so many other things because I'll literally go through a couple gallons of water a day. Yes. In other other uses than just straight drinking water. But a lot of people actually do use the water for tea and coffee mm-hmm. because of the flavor. I'm sure it's amazing. The wow. flavor is that people go, my coffee is not bitter anymore. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't have a bitter taste. My tea tastes sweet and I don't put sugar in it. You know, so a lot of people use it because they replace it. And of course, that's still taking water in. That counts for your six to eight glasses of water a day. So uh, although you should drink probably more than three cups of coffee. A <laughs> but... Still, you know, it, it makes it, it counts towards your water. And we've had people who used to drink a gallon of water a day or two gallons because right. they just did not get hydrated. Yes. And then all of a sudden they get on our water and they're drinking six cups a day. And going, I'm full. I don't need any more. So this is like super hydration water. It's super hydration water. So, Stephen, talk to us about the... Um, the different blood markers and urine markers we look at for hydration and how we can see what the difference is in drinking divinity water for hydration levels. Well, one of the things that's interesting, when you first start on divinity water, it also has a detoxing effect for you. Yes. And you can see <laughs> Yeah, it does. Some people will will say that they get flushed. Some people will break out in hives a little bit mm-hmm. or acne. And that lasts for about two or three days and it goes away. Well, one of the reasons is is because the amount of toxins being flushed out of your body just fills your body. And then then eventually it overcomes your organs. And that's why you don't feel, you might feel like you have a flu. Then after about three days, all that's flushed out. Um, or people don't have reactions to it. Or if you have mercury in your mouth people will drink our water and go it tastes like metal i taste metal and i tell them the first thing they do is better go to a doctor to a dentist and get all their amalgam taken out of their teeth we had one guy who thought she had ms and she'd been diagnosed from it. he was on ms medication and she tasted our water and says it tastes like metal and i said you've got mercury in your your teeth and that's causing your MS symptoms. She goes, no, 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 no. I, you know, I had worked on my teeth 15, 20 years ago, but the doctor says I have MS. And I said, you don't have MS. You have leaky amalgam in your, yeah. in your fillings. And so I said, go get a second opinion. After about two months, she decided she'd go get a second opinion. The second opinion was, you're getting mercury poisoning. Right, right. And you better pull all those linings out. She had them all pulled out, put ceramic in. And you know what? Her MS signs completely disappeared. It's so interesting that you're bringing this up because I used to be what we called the DAMS doctor, the Dental Amalgam Association. Oh. And there were so many people who went into the dentist's office 
in wheelchairs who left Hal Huggins, for instance, walking because they got their mercury removed safely and appropriately. These days we understand about doing IVs at the same time. See, I have a patient right now who's just undergone that this morning. Mm. So, yes, there are very, very special holistic dentists. I caution you to make sure that those are the only people that you work with who are highly trained and know how to remove the mercury in a way that won't make you more sick. Yes. So, it, yes. It, it does cause them as symptoms. So if you get some of our water and it tastes like metal, run to your dentist as quick as possible. Right. <laughs> the other thing, people, if you measure your urine, one of the things we found out is that your urine specific gravity will be very high for the first couple of days because you're flushing all the toxins out of your body. My wife's urine was so, when she first started drinking it, was so heavy that when we took the results to the doctor he says you know these are results i see from people in a coma <coughs> and we said well evidently she's not in a coma <laughs> she's pretty healthy it's this and she must be flushing a lot of toxins out of her body and she was and then it went back to normal one of the people uh, another person we had that is now using it her uncle had a heartbeat from 176 to 196 beats per minute. Wow. He has Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and um, he had atrial fibrillation. So he was in hospice at her house. So they were just kind of waiting for him to pass at, at that heart problem. And they have a couple of nurses that come in once a week. Well, she put him on this water on a Monday. <clears throat> and she was Monday night. She was sitting in her living room Tuesday night. And he came walking out of the bed bedroom, sat down and said, hi, how are you? Well, she almost passed out because she thought it was a ghost. <laughs> because this guy was bedridden and had not walked for a while. Right. She said, are you okay? I feel fine. She said, you realize you walked? He goes, no, I didn't, but what's the big deal? She said, let me measure your heart. She measured his heart, and his heartbeat was 76 beats per minute. That's amazing. It, it, it dropped. Then she found out, listening to his heart, he no longer had atrial fibrillation. It went away. So the next day, the nurses came over, and they looked at him and said, what happened? Uh, what's the change in him? She said, measure his heart and listen to it. They measured it and found out it was 76 beats per minute, and that the atrial fibrillation went away. And he had atrial fibrillation for almost 20 years, I believe. So he, he, he had returned almost to normal. The problem was she was giving him enough water that he was really detoxing and his Alzheimer's seemed to have gotten worse. He, he was confused. So I told her about the detox effect. So she cut back on his water and found out if she cut it too much, his heart rate went back up, but his brain started clearing. So now he's remembering stuff from when he was a child. And so she balances how much water she gives him to make sure his heartbeat is down, but she's not detoxing him too much. So she's doing a very fine balance on it right now, which I find interesting um, because his Alzheimer's seems to be going away. He's remembering things. He remembers who she was and the people in his family. Um, but if he detoxes too much, it seems the toxins are going in and clogging that. But um, his heartbeat comes down. So she is kind of balancing that between doing too much detox and keeping his heart rate down. And she seems to have it balanced right now. So, Stephen, it sounds like we're coming up with that. I mean, I don't want to get real 
heavy about it, but almost like a hypothetical awareness about how the importance of water's detoxification for the overall health of the function of our brain and the function of our heart. And those two have more motive mitochondria than any other parts of the body, the heart and the brain, and then we move to the muscles. I mean, in the organs, it's really amazing. Uh, it's amazing what water does. It's absolutely amazing. One of the doctors that we're speaking with has written a book on the heart. And he has found out that the heart isn't sturdy enough to pump the blood that the way it does. We're talking about Dr. Thomas Cowan, right? Yes. And Rudolf Steiner talked about this in the early 1900s. Yes. The heart isn't strong enough muscle to do what it does. It's not a pump. It can't possibly be if you look at it. Yeah. And he's it in this book. It's so thin that it should yeah. burst. So, and that's the problem with high blood pressure and everything else. So, he has found out that even if the heart stops, the blood will keep flowing through the body for a period of time. And he now believes that it has to do something with this charge in the water. And we talked about it at this fourth stage of water in the EZ. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like there's so much more to water that we don't realize. So very much. And the body, the water is meant to detox the body. It's meant to get, carry the trash can chemical reactions out of your body, either through the urine or through the feces, but that is blocked by the contaminated water. Contaminated water stops there. Now, speaking about how hydration, there's a big question about what is hydration? Mm -hmm. Everybody has their idea of what hydration is. Gatorade has their idea of hydration. <laughs> it's sugar and a lot of chemicals. Electrolytes and yeah, Electrolytes colors and, and yeah. Flavorings. It turns out there's a concept in blood plasma, in biology, in chemistry called osmolality or osmolarity. Mm -hmm. and that's the saturation of particles in water or the saturation of particles in your blood. Yes. And what happens is that your cell tries to balance its particles in water against what's in your blood. And so it tries to equalize the pressure. Well, when you dilute your blood with pure water, because you're putting water in and you aren't putting more particles in, it increases or it decreases the osmolarity of your blood system. The first rule of that is that it causes water to flow into your cell. So you now have more water in your cell. To equalize that, the cell then tries to get out extra particles that it doesn't want. It tries to rid them. So it dumps these toxins back into your bloodstream, and then you flush them out. It's carried out. So by drinking very pure water, you are actually being hydrated. In fact, this hydration is so extreme. If you take a red blood cell, and you put it in pure water, the red blood cell will keep absorbing water till it blows up because it just drinks water and it drinks water. And of course, there's no bounds on it. So it just keeps drinking it. And of course, that's a lot more. It, it tries to get rid of all its particles and drink water. But that doesn't happen in the body. But what happens in the body is the cells actually flow water into it. Now, each cell in your body has to have one million molecules of water per second flow in and out of it. One million molecules of water per second through each cell in your body. And that's what keeps your cells healthy. And of course that flow causes electricity, which causes the mitochondria to react, et cetera, et cetera. When you stop that flow by whatever, you have too much sodium in your system, too much potassium, you got pesticides, you got arsenic, you got radiation, you got you know too many drugs, whatever it is. 
that stops that water flow into the cell or decreases it and the cell gets inflamed. So Stephen, would you ever have anyone put minerals into your water? Uh, are you always going to drink it just pure native water? I'm a firm believer that you get your minerals from the food. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I believe in non-GMO food. Me too. I believe in that you, because that's what, that's how man forever got his minerals. He went out and he would eat an odor that's off of a tree or the grass or whatever. And every now and then he might be lucky and kill an animal to eat the protein off of it. But for the most part, you know, nothing was contaminated. He wandered. He would eat what the earth provided, which is rich in minerals. Now, when volcanoes would explode, of course, they would spew lava out, rich in minerals. That would all decay a million years later, become a nice farmland or grassland like you know, the United States used to be great prairies of grass with buffalo roaming, roaming. They would eat the grass. They would urinate uh, the feces. They would then use that mineral to trample into the earth, and it was very rich. Uh, we killed most of the buffalo, the bison here. Uh, we overfarm the land now. We don't rotate the crops. So most of the food is depleted of minerals. So if you live that type of lifestyle, yes, I would take minerals enough so that you would um, satisfy what you need on a daily basis. So Stephen, I've been um, working with seaweeds. And like in particular, I eat RNA and I'll just soak it in a little water and I keep it by the sink and I'll eat a bite of it, I don't know, four or five times a day like the Japanese do. Yeah. to get amazing levels of minerals. But I still noticed when I started drinking the water that I was getting cramps in my life. Mm. So I took homeopathic magfos, which would take care of the cramps. And then I noticed I was getting some during the day. So I took some califos, which is potassium phosphate in homeopathic form, which teaches my body to absorb those more effectively. Yes. But it did seem like I did a lot better when I actually succumbed and took some actual supplement of both magnesium. I, I like it in a three and eight form to the brain. And, um, and sometimes I'll use taurate for the heart and, um, and then potassium. Right. So I'm just, you know, wondering what you have to say about that. I mean, we are very depleted in this country and especially, you know, I'm 65 years old. Uh, most women are very low in magnesium. Now, personally, I eat practically ketogenic. Everything I eat is grass-fed. Mm. Um, I make my own ghee. We, um, you know, slow cook all of our meats. I make bone and meat broths, so I get the gelatins and all the minerals from the bones of the animals that are grass-fed. And we eat real duck eggs. I eat mm. milk raw. You know, I mean, I do a lot of really healthy things for myself, homemade sauerkrauts. Mm. And I kind of encourage my patients to do the same thing and then also to follow the circadian rhythms and not to just be high fat, but um, especially when summer comes, when we have when nature provides for us real carbohydrates, mm. we'll eat them. But we tend to stay away from things like high gluten foods and the grains that are so high in lectins and really look at the foods that people do well with and don't do well with based on their ancestries. So I'm just curious, um, you're, you're never telling people to use minerals in the water. Is that correct? Uh, I think you take a supplement with the water. Uh -huh. uh, the, the problem is, is that our digestive enzymes want to digest those minerals. Yes. And, and we're built to digest food. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we aren't built to eat rocks. Um, right. No, so we don't want to take minerals and rocks on either. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, and water is meant to be, help those enzymes digest your food. Mm -hmm. In fact, what happens when you eat, you actually get slightly dehydrated. 
because water flows out of the cells into the stomach to help the stomach. And then that water is supposed to flow back in and, and um, flow back into the cells again and help the osmolarity of the system. So the, that's why you kind of feel lethargic sometime after eating a meal because you've actually had water flow out of your cells to balance the osmolarity. <clears throat> One of the things we advocate if people are hungry, drink a glass of water. Uh -huh. it, it tends to kill the appetite real quick. Yes. Um, and that's because what happens is water flows in the cells. It starts stopping the enzymes from signaling that you're hungry. And you can go longer. Uh, one of the people that we had went on a two-week fast uh, with our water. I just did uh, a three-day one. Yeah, I did. I did four days, and I wasn't hungry at all. I never mm -hmm. got hungry. I lost twenty pounds. It was terrific. But um, it isn't hard. I mean, it's amazing. It really isn't hard. I think we're more of a creature of habit now. For me, I, I think more and more, you know, you, you just feel like, well, it's time to eat, but you aren't really hungry, but you eat. Um, so, you know, if you want to kill your appetite, drink water before and then see how hungry you are after. Um, so water... When you don't drink water with your food and you eat your food, it pulls water out of the cells to help it move back into the system. And that's why you feel lethargic till that water gets back in again. Um, so we've been advocating that people not drink water with their food mm -hmm. and that they wait at least a half an hour to an hour after eating the meal to have a nice big glass of water. Right. Does that fit into the, your findings as well? It does. But I think you ought to drink water before you eat your food. I, I think you ought to have a glass of water half an hour or an hour before you eat. And then see if you're hungry. Right. See, what happens for most of my patients now, because we're really getting into ketosis, we don't, we're not hungry except for once or twice a day because we have yes. this fabulous fat store and our mitochondria constantly producing energy for us because 80 to 85% of our calories are from fat, high quality, you know, saturated fats. So people find they really only want to eat one or two meals a day. Yeah. Lost the, the desire to, to unnaturally eat that comes from carbohydrates. And sugars. Right. That's exactly right. The worst thing is you can be in around people who like to eat three times or five times a day. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, we're around people like that all the time, and you know, it's like we just like feeling healthy, so we do it. It's good. Yeah, it's a habit. I really think eating has gotten into a habit. Mm -hmm. I, I think probably when we were um, twenty thousand years ago or whatever, we ate big meals when we found them, when we could kill them and eat. Right. Other than that, we just scrounged around and ate, you know, grains or nuts or berries or what was available at that time. Yeah, but, and there weren't that many nuts and berries, I can tell you. I mean, I've yeah, had I, woods for yeah. a couple of years. There's not a great, huge abundance. Yeah. There's roots and there's barks. Yes. But there's not a big abundance of berries. And, you know, once in a great blue moon, you might find an uh, eye with some honey. <laughs> yeah. But it's rare. And, you know, people will oftentimes go for a couple of days before they shoot an animal and have the food to eat and they primarily ate the organ meats and right. the muscle meats. And yep. So we have a very different way of eating than our DNA is designed for. Yes. And a lot of us are starting to move back into the natural way of eating that our ancestors did. Right. It seems to be greatly supporting our health and to me, the divinity of water is giving us a water that's closer to what yeah, our ancestors pure, had. The pure water that they had. Yeah. You know, they knew to stay away from bad water sources. And remember, we were uh, a wandering tribe back then until they started farming. Yes. So we never polluted. We wouldn't stay in one area and pollute a source stream. We would move on. Mm -hmm. on it. Now and we... We dump everything in it, you know, we throw our trash in it and 
Yes. 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 That's how we are now. Yes, it's very different. Well, many of us are beginning to adopt some of these very wise ancient traditions, and we're bringing it together with the brilliance of the science of today. And that's what I see you as being a gift to us. One of those incredibly brilliant scientists who honors the wisdom of what God gave us on this earth and is learning how to honor it by cleaning helping us to have clean, pure water, and, and giving our bodies a chance to show us what, what our bodies can do for us, the wisdom of the body. That's, and, that's exactly right, the wisdom of the body. I mean, it's like a machine, nothing else that we've ever seen on the face of this earth. It's been so far beyond machine. It's oh, like yeah. a walking miracle. It is, a, it is a walking miracle. If you even think about the things that it does every second, Oh, it's amazing. Every second, a million molecules moves through every cell in your body. The water. And I've been looking at 400 pounds of ATP a day. I mean, yeah. it's amazing. I mean, if we, if we didn't produce ATP for one second, we would die. I mean, right. it's just, yeah. and it's all about movement of light, photons. Yes. So another day, I'd love to have you back, Stephen, and I'd love to talk with you about... Photons, um, photons actually, not photons, um, biophotons and water and um, light and how light and, and water together are these, you know, like kissing cousins who produce an amazing, amazing gift for us all. And yeah, how we can be wise about this. So I just want to thank you so very much for being with us today. And I want to let people know that. Um, this uh, talk that we are sharing with you through YouTube is also available on our website, awakeninghealth.com. And um, you can order the Divinia water by calling us, or you can also go to Stephen's website, diviniawater.com, and there you can order his beautiful water. And he's available through the website, and his lovely daughter, Kirsten, beautiful wife, and they're all incredible sources of knowledge and have watched thousands of people get well using this water in the most unusual of circumstances where one might be completely shocked to know that the water made that big of a difference. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, as always. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. We can hardly ever shut up. I'm, I'm sorry that we've kept going for so long. We'll probably have to divide this into two or three talks. Yeah. But we are looking forward to doing many more for you. So please feel free to get in touch with me. Let me know what areas you'd like to hear about. And we'll tap into this brilliant man's wisdom about water and science and physics and Thai math and learn more for him about how we can support our bodies and the importance of water. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Many blessings to you all. And you too. Thank you.